So the first question I'd like to ask you, you were very young when you first wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the experience that led to that uh, and what it meant for you? Absolutely. Uh, you're right. I was very young when the dream was conceived of me wanting to be an astronaut. And that occurred when I was all of 10 years old. Uh, it was during the very last Apollo mission, Apollo 17. Mm -hmm. You can imagine a 10-year-old boy watching an old vacuum tube technology, black and white TV, yeah. and, uh, and holding on to the rabbit ear antenna to uh, make sure the reception was optimum. And watching on TV was uh, none other than astronaut Gene Cernan walking on the moon. The very last man who's ever walked on, on the moon, by the way. We haven't gone mm -hmm. back since. And, uh, and so there I am watching Gene Cernan listening to the reporter Walter Cronkite narrate that moonwalk, giving all these facts and figures. And then I would go outside and look up and see the moon. And then I would go back inside and see Gene Cernan walking on the moon. And I said, wow. It's kind of like you found your calling. I said, I found my calling. This is what I want to be. Yeah. I want to be an astronaut. And, uh, and that's, what, that's how that dream was conceived, is as a 10-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And so what happened from there? Well, what happened from there, I think the best thing that I could have done that same evening I saw Gene Cernan, astronaut Gene Cernan, walk on the moon, was I shared that dream with my father. Mm -hmm. On our way to go to sleep that night, my dad was walking in front of me, I was walking behind him, and I told my dad, hey, dad. He says, yes, son. He said, I know what I want to be when I grow up. He said, what's that? He said, I want to be an astronaut. He stops dead in his tracks, puts his hands on his hips, turns around and looks at me and says, you want to be what? I said, I want to be an astronaut. He looks at me again, and he points to the kitchen. He said, let's go to the kitchen. What and did my, that mean My for you? eyes got this big, because there's only three things that happen in the kitchen. And two of them were done already. First thing we do is every day after school, my mom sits us down and we do our homework. Mm -hmm. That was done. Second, we all sit down as a family and eat dinner. That was done. Third, that's where they like to dole out the punishment if you misbehave, which was not done, <laughs> hence my concern. So I, uh, what I did was I very carefully walked to the kitchen and my dad was waiting for me already and then he has me sit down and he has me justify why I want to be an astronaut. So I just regurgitate all the facts and figures the reporter uh, Walter Cronkite had just said on TV. I said, well, Dad, I can't believe that we as humans can travel a quarter million miles away and uh, come back safe and sound. So I want to be part of that. And he must have saw the determination of a 10-year-old boy because my dad only has a third grade education, but the next thing he said was so powerful, I'm convinced that's what kept that dream alive. He didn't squash it. He sort of fed it and nurtured it. Mm -hmm. He said, I think you can reach your goal. But if you want to do it, he said, you need to follow this recipe, five simple steps to the T, he says. And if you follow it, I, as your father, will promise you'll uh, become an astronaut. Immediately, I turned into a sponge ready to absorb everything he was going to say. And I asked him, what are those five steps, Dad? Yeah. He said, simple, son. He said, first, he said, you decide what you want to be in life. What does Jose want to be when he grows up? Second, he said, recognize how far you are from that goal. Third, draw yourself a road map so that it can guide you to, mm -hmm. and keep you focused on your goal. Fourth, he said education. He says, There's no substitute for an education. Fifth, he says, you know that same work ethic you put out, picking fruits and vegetables Saturdays and Sundays and seven days a week uh, during the summer because we were a migrant farm working family? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, Dan. He said, that same work ethic, he pointed to my books on the kitchen table. He says, you put it here. And when you graduate and get a job, he says, you put it in your job. And he closed off by saying, he said, always, always 
give more than what people expect out of you. He said, you mix that up and that's the recipe to succeed. And I remember going to bed so happy because I said, wow, my dad thinks I could be an astronaut, ergo I'm going to be one. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So uh, you said that your family was, um, you were a, a migrant workers. Yes. Uh, so you, you reached the stars from unlikely, an unlikely place and difficult circumstances. Um, can you tell us more about your family and uh, your early life? Sure, sure. Well, ever since I could remember, first of all, my parents are from Mexico. Mm -hmm. and, um, and ever since my dad was a kid, at 15 years old, he would come to the U.S. to work mm -hmm. in the fields, mm -hmm. harvesting uh, whatever was in season. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he got older, he married my mom from the same hometown and started bringing her over. Well, as, 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 as like a natural marriage, kids come along and depending what part of the year you were born, dictated what country you were born in. Because we would spend nine months in the U.S three months in Mexico. And so what would happen was, uh, you know, I was born during the nine months we're here in August, which is still harvest time. Mm -hmm. So I was born in the US and so was my brother. I have another brother and sister. They were born in a winter and they were born in Mexico. So it was just the luck of the draw. And so our life was a pretty nomadic life because we would spend uh, nine months in the US in California but it would be three different places in California, two months, two months, and five months. Uh, and started in Southern California, Central California, and we ended up in Northern California. Then we would go to Mexico. So you can see it wasn't a very conducive environment to get a good education. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what mm -hmm. changed for the best was one day, uh, I'm the youngest of four, when uh, we were getting ready to go to Mexico, at our last stop, my dad would get up a week before, as it was tradition, make the announcement to the kids and say, kids, get three months worth of homework from your teachers because we're going to Mexico next week. So I went and ran and told my teacher, Miss Young, and Miss Young said, hey, tell your parents I'm going to come visit them uh, today. And so my, my teacher comes and convinces my parents that uh, we need to stay in one place. And uh, to my dad's uh, credit, he heeded that advice by my teacher. Mm -hmm. And we started making our last stop in Stockton, California, our permanent home. So our education started to get traction. Mm -hmm. uh, we were still farm workers because every Saturday and Sunday, there I was helping out with a family income. And uh, while most kids love summer vacation, we hated it because that meant we had to work seven days a week out in the fields. Uh, but you, as you can see, it wasn't a very, very uh, conducive environment and the, you know, the socioeconomic challenges that we face were pretty big. But I think, uh, I think the fact that we had parents that were engaged uh, we had people like Miss Young, other teachers that helped us along. Uh, that made things uh, somewhat more manageable and allowed all four of us to go to college. How did the doors open on your path to becoming an astronaut? Well, doors started opening as a result of what I would consider hard work. I always tell people uh, uh, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Uh, and so, and so you just start working hard. Uh, you know, you got to go to college. So uh, you start working hard in college. Uh, you still had to get a job to help pay for college. So I think a lot of people would just appreciate the work ethic that I had and uh, that helped open a lot of doors. Mm -hmm. and, and so for that, uh, I mean, I'm very grateful because I, I have always considered myself uh, the product of a lot of people's effort in helping me along. There's no way I can pretend that I reached becoming an astronaut by myself. It's not a 
a self-accomplishment. I think it's a family accomplishment. It's an accomplishment of the community, of the education system. Uh, even me and my wife helped me a lot in that sense as well. And so we, everybody puts, had something to do with my success and uh, that is something that I certainly recognize. Yeah. And, and in terms of obstacles that you may have faced along the way, given that you are, um, uh, you come from a migrant family, Mexican parents, um, did, you, did you experience any um, obstacles in terms of prejudice along the way? So now you uh, absolutely, I mean, uh, yeah, especially in those times, uh, you know, there was no English as a second language programs at schools. You were put in with uh, the rest of the population and, uh, you know, you either sink or swim. And I remember one day uh, when I was in school, um, my mom used to pack us lunch. And so we used to take burritos, tacos. And I remember one of the uh, Anglo kids saw what I was eating and made fun of me and because uh, and, they had sandwiches, right? And so they made some type of racial remark. I remember going back to home telling my mom I didn't want to go to school anymore because, uh, because of you know, incidents like this. And uh, she just sat me down and she gave me an advice I would never forget. She said, she said you know, show them who you are. She says, uh, kill them with love. And, and I didn't understand what she, was, she meant by that. I said, what do you mean? She says, show them who you really are. Keep showing them who you are. And sooner or later, you're going to win them over. And I started doing that. And sure enough, it worked. So um, we were talking last evening. Mm -hmm. uh, you weren't immediately successful with your NASA application. Um, how? Um, can you say a little bit about how you persisted and how finally uh, you were accepted? Sure, yeah, absolutely. I wasn't uh, successful the first time around at trying to get selected as an astronaut. But as soon as I found that I had all the boxes checked to be able to apply to become an astronaut, I started applying. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, I got rejected the first time and, okay, I expected it. I said, maybe not the first time, but maybe the second time or third time. And then I got rejected the second and the third time and the fourth time. Finally, it came to the sixth time. And I remember receiving the letter. It didn't even have my name. It said, Dear Applicant. It says, more than 18,000 people apply that have the minimum requirements. Uh, and from these 18,000, we select 100 where they can spend a week at NASA and we can take a good look at them, give them a good physical uh, aptitude test, psychological tests, and interviews. From those 100, we'll select 10 to 15. So unfortunately, you're not one of them. So after six of those rejection letters, yeah. finally crumpled the sixth one, and I threw it in our, on our bedroom floor, and I said, I'm done with this. I was ready to give up six rejections, you know? I said, clearly NASA doesn't want me. And I remember my wife, started cleaning up the room and she finds a paper and she mm -hmm. unravels it and she says what's this i said well i said i'm giving up on my dream i said you know nasa rejected me six times clearly they don't want me and uh and she looked at me and she says that doesn't sound like you i said you're not a quitter i know you i said don't feel sorry for yourself and then she says and don't disqualify yourself let nasa not select you don't deselect yourself and she says, because I know you, I said, you're always going to wonder, what if? What if I would have put in that seventh application mm -hmm. or the eighth one or the ninth one? What if? I said, and it's going to eat inside of you and it's going to make you a bitter man. She says, so don't do that to yourself. Wait till NASA tells you to stop sending in applications. And I said, you know what? She's right. So she kind of gave me a second wind. And so that's what kept me applying, you know, another six times because uh, they rejected me a total of 11 times. It wasn't until the 12th time that I finally got selected. Wow. So. so I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, finally when you are an astronaut. 
Um, can you tell our readers and um, our viewers a little bit about um, astronaut training and also what an astronaut might do uh, when you're not in space, which is most of the time? Right. Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, when you get selected, you get selected as an astronaut candidate. Uh, that means you're not eligible for a flight assignment because you still have to go through training. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first things they do is they send you to Pensacola and you learn how to fly jets. Uh, then you come back to NASA in Houston and you start learning how to operate the space shuttle, uh, how to operate the International Space Station, and then you start going through a series of exams, written exams of all the 16 main subsystems of the shuttle, how they work, written exams on how the International Space Station works, uh, and then you go through practical exams, hands-on exams, and then you go through simulations, flight simulations, where they start breaking equipment and you start, you got to figure out how to fix things or, or how to react appropriately yeah. uh, in those failures because that's what it's all about. And uh, once, that takes a process of about two years. Uh, and people say, how were those two years? I said, well, imagine being in finals week when you're studying for finals. Imagine two straight years of that because you feel like you're right under the magnifying glass and they're evaluating you on everything. Oh. So it's very draining. Mm -hmm. But once you do that, you get your wings, you're eligible for a flight assignment, while you wait for your flight assignment, you get assigned a, a, a technical assignment uh, to support the space program, to support other astronauts that are going up in space. And my job was an astronaut support personnel, which was to uh, prep the uh, space shuttle before every launch. So two weeks before every launch, I would go to Florida mm -hmm. and calibrate all the flight equipment, everything, and then I would strap in the crew Unfortunately, my face was the last one they would see before they took off into space. <laughs> and uh, and so, um, so I did that for two years uh, and uh, about seven missions. And then my turn got called. I was assigned to a crew, STS-128. Uh, we were to fly the Space Shuttle Discovery, 14-day uh, mission to the International Space Station, second to last mission to finish construction of the International Space Station. And uh, we would have to train for another two years, specific training. So I, le I left that astronaut support personnel post and dedicated myself almost two years of training for that 14-day mission with a crew of seven of us. Wow. And, uh, and, uh, and that's how we began that training portion of it uh, before we blasted off into space. How did that training portion, uh, the second training portion be at before the shuttle mission, how did that compare to your initial two years? Was it even more intense than? Well, the initial two years were, uh, were very broad, it's kind of like broad stroke of brush. Mm -hmm. You learned about the space shuttle, you learned about the subsystems, you learned about the International Space Station and the subsystems, you learned how to fly jets and their subsystems. So it was a more broad general training, kind of building the base. Mm -hmm. And then once you uh, get assigned to the mission, you focus on the shuttle and the, uh, and, and the space station. You already have a base, so you build upon that the more of the specifics related to the actual activities for your mission. Mm -hmm. So now, if, uh, if you're not going to use a piece of equipment uh, during your mission that's part of the shuttle or the station that's not flight related, they don't care, you don't worry about it. You just focus on the stuff that you're gonna actually be working on and you practice it hundreds if not thousands of times so that when you get up there, uh, you can do it with your hands, uh, with your eyes closed. Mm -hmm. During the launch of the shuttle, you're, you're there. You're somewhat isolated from other human beings who I believe are about two miles away. away. Um, you're sitting on top of basically what's a, a, a volatile missile. Yeah. Were you scared at all? Yeah, there's an element of concern uh, that when you're up there because, you know, there's only seven of us up there. Like you said, people are three, four miles away. Uh, you're sitting on thousands of gallons of combustible material. Uh, basically, what you're doing is you're going to light a bomb that explodes in a controlled fashion. And, uh, and so, you know, you have moments there of reflection and, uh, and you wonder, hey, is life going to end 
here in this situation or do, does life continue? And so you make peace with your maker and uh, you leave it to him, to her, to, to uh, decide the outcome. Uh, but you know, you know you've done the best you can in life and so I was just hoping I can return to be able to uh, describe my experience. Mm -hmm. When you finally reached orbit, uh, can you describe some of the, your activities uh, once, you, once you were there? Sure. Well, when I reached orbit, first of all, getting to orbit is, is a very short time frame. It's only eight and a half minutes. You go from zero wow. miles per hour on the launch platform. In the span of eight and a half minutes, you go from zero to 17,500 miles an hour or 25,000 mile, 25,000 kilometers per hour, uh, which is amazing. Uh, you know, it's the best ride Disneyland can ever <laughs> hope to design. I think they get green with envy each time we describe it. And once you're up there, uh, you reach Miko main engine cutoff. Now you're about 300 miles above ground and uh, you're going around the world at 17,500 miles an hour, uh, which means you go around the world once every 90 minutes. And now all of a sudden you're in a microgravity, uh, zero G environment. So now you feel like you're gonna float, you got your seatbelt, and until you take off your seatbelts when you actually float, which is the best sensation. <laughs> That's just amazing. I mean, uh, words just can't do it justice what one feels when you're up there and feeling that sensation for the very first time. You've been where very few people have gone before. What were your initial sensations and impressions? Well, I guess the, um, my initial reaction was, um, you know, as a flight engineer, I'm one of the last ones to get out of our seats because both the pilots and I are, are prepping the vehicle, purging fuel lines, uh, turning on life support systems, everything. Uh, which takes quite a while, it takes about an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're about, we're, we had made about one revolution around the earth and we're coming back over in North America when I finally take off, when I finally take off my, uh, my seatbelt and I start floating off the seat. And so then I push myself to do my best Superman impersonation towards the window and see, uh, and see the earth for the first time. And I tell you, it gave me chills just looking at it because, uh, you know, I'm thinking, wow. I said, I'm one of about 500 people who have had the privilege of seeing our world from this perspective. Mm -hmm. And then I pushed myself to the other window, and I call that the window to the universe because it's opposite of the earth. And I look at that and I go back and see the perfection of our planet Earth. And I convinced myself, I said, you know, this is too perfect to be a coincidence. I said, there's a supreme being out there that has caused this. And, you know, that just strengthened my faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, you know, I just became more of a believer, just reinforced it. Uh, which was a uh, which was a great experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I would call it a spiritual experience uh, being up there. Do you think that your uh, uh, those who were with you on the mission did they have? Do you know if any of them had similar experiences? I'm sure we. I'm sure they did. But uh, you know, we all kept it at a very professional level. Yeah, I mean, speaking share, after. Yeah, afterwards, uh, you know, we we didn't share the. Uh, we, we didn't share the, uh, the, those type of experiences. Yes. So your family, your family is uh, devoutly Catholic. Uh, yes. how, did, how did your experience in, in space uh, affect your faith? Well, I think it, 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 just, it just reinforced it in the sense of, uh, like I said, it, you know, this is just too perfect to be a coincidence. Mm -hmm. And it just reinforced it. And, you know, I came back and told my family about it and, uh, mm -hmm. and what kind of experience I had. So if anything, you know, a lot of people always argue with me and or ask, not argue, but ask the question. Is it how can science and religion coexist and how can you kind of believe in both, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the perfect answer I have for them is, of course, they can coexist. There's room. 
uh, in not, not only in the world, but in people's mind to be able to process both of them because, uh, you know, science, I think, tells you how things happen. Mm -hmm. It's the rules of engagement of physics and how particles react and all that. That's what science tells you, how things happen. Mm -hmm. I think religion tells you why things happen. And so you put those together and you have a good balance. And I think that's what makes a well-balanced individual. Mm -hmm. You're the father of five. You've seen the magnificence of space and the beauty of the Earth. Uh, it's not, it's not a, a fair comparison, but what was more uh, miraculous mm -hmm. in, in your estimation, seeing the beauty of space or the birth of your first child? Well, uh, fortunately, I was there for the birth of my first child, and I have to tell you that, you know, the uh, gift of life, the process of uh, procreating two individuals who can create an individual, and you see that individual come to life uh, and being greeted by us, uh, that's, I mean, there's no words for that. I mean, that's a miracle in itself. And uh, you know, hands down, that is uh, that it, that is the most uh, uh, miraculous thing I would I would say uh, far better than going to space. Yeah. One final question: uh, Once you returned to Earth, uh, how did your experience in space uh, affect your life in some concrete ways? Well, I think um, you know, th there's three takeaways um, that I that I have from going to space. The first one we discussed already, which is, uh, you know, strengthening my faith in my religion. Yeah. Um, the second one was, um, was during that same period when I was gonna look at Earth for the first time, uh, you know, I, I start thinking on my way over there while doing my Superman impersonation, uh, is, is what am I gonna see? You know, and uh, of course, I have a flashback from the fifth grade, learning world geography. You know, where my teacher, Miss Cotton, sort of spins the globe and points at a country, and you and you can tell which country it is because it's a different color. And so you you write the country in the capital, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was going over there, obviously I didn't expect to see the countries in different colors, but I expected to be able to differentiate them. And what was so beautiful was the fact that. I could certainly make out Canada, because mm -hmm. we're flying over North America and Central America. I can make out Canada, but what struck me is that I couldn't make out where Canada ended and the U.S. began. Mm -hmm. I can make out the United States, but I couldn't differentiate where the United States ended mm -hmm. and Mexico began, and so on and so forth down Central America. And I said, my God, I had to leave this world to come to the realization that borders are human-made concepts designed to separate us. And how sad, how sad that that is the case. And I immediately said, wouldn't it be wonderful to get all of, a wor of our world leaders, give them this opportunity of reflection by seeing the world from my perspective. And I'll guarantee you, if that was the case, when they return, I would guarantee you the world will be a much, much better place than it is today. Uh, but uh, that was the first take, you know, that was the second takeaway that I, I uh, had. Uh, the third one was, I mentioned that when we go up, we go up about 500 kilometers, you know, maybe 300 miles up, and we're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, 25,000 kilometers an hour, which means we go around the world every 90 minutes. That means I see either a sunrise or a sunset every 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. On one of those, I was watching a, uh, a, a sunrise. We were coming over from the dark side of the earth and, uh, and the sun was coming off the horizon of the earth. And just if you keep staring at it long enough, you see the reflections of the sun at just the right angle where you can actually see the layer of our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And what I saw made me an instant, instant tree hugger. Uh, because uh, I became an environmentalist because what I saw was scary. The atmosphere is super, super thin. Mm -hmm. Looks very fragile. 
that I immediately told myself, you know, our environmentalists down there are correct. We got to take care of our earth, be good stewards of our environment, because mm -hmm. anything we do down there, it's going to upset this delicate balance. And this is what's keeping us alive. Mm -hmm. So we got to be careful and treat our world with a lot of respect and our environment and don't pollute and conserve energy. And I promised myself that when I came home, I, you know, I would incorporate this in all my talks. You know, the fact that, you know, the environment is uh, looks pretty, pretty fragile from up there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those were the kind of like the three reflections that I had. Yeah. Could you say a little bit about your the foundation that you've started? Absolutely. I have a foundation which we um, which we um, started in 2006. And I started it because of the fact that, uh, tell you the truth, when I wanted to become an astronaut, I did it for a selfish reason, reason which is I wanted to become an astronaut. Uh, when I got selected, I noticed that you know I created a big following, especially amongst kids that yearn to see that role model. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I kind of said, man, this is like magic in a bottle. We got to put it in a bottle and we got to bottle it and distribute it. And so the answer to that was let's create a foundation uh, based on my name and, uh, and, and cr design it such that the goal is to increase the number of folks going into the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and math. And, uh, and our, our foundation basically has three main activities. First one is we have what's called a science blast where we have over 1,200 kids, fifth graders, mm -hmm. 10 years old, no, no accident, uh, where we expose them to science and technology via hands-on exploratorium mm -hmm. type of activities. And then we also uh, have workshops for the teachers to improve their teaching efficiency and making science and math more fun. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing we have is we have a science academy where we have seventh graders through 12th graders, the seniors in high school, that go to a university setting during the summer for five weeks. And we expose them not only to a university setting, mm -hmm but also to next year's curriculum in science and math. And then we focus on one activity that utilizes these skills, whether it be sailing, flying, or setting up weather balloons for can sets. Uh, so we have those type of activities. And third thing we do is we offer scholarships, funding allowing uh, to first generation uh, students that are going to school. In other words, their parents have not uh, graduated from college. Mm -hmm. So we offer them scholarships just to give that little push and to break that barrier, that glass ceiling, uh, because we figure once we get one of them to school, when they have kids, it's gonna be more likely that they're gonna be uh, able to go to school mm -hmm. based on their parents' experience. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, that's what the foundation does, and it's called Reaching for the Stars, and you could find it at astrojh.org if you look for it on the web. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here. All right, thank you very much, Anne. Appreciate it.